The ringing of a house phone ripped me from a deep sleep. It was 4 a.m. Because of that call, I'm here speaking with you today. And I truly wish I didn't have a reason to be here. But I do. A gentleman by the name of Josh Shipp has a quote that I really like. You either get bitter or you get better. It's that simple. You either take what has been dealt you and allow it to make you a better person or you allow it to tear you down. The choice does not belong to fate. It belongs to you. I can think of several reasons why on any given day I might be bitter. And I suspect that most of you can too. But today I want to talk about one event that had an impact on my life that I never could have imagined. Everyone here has had bitter moments, bitter thoughts, and perhaps even taken bitter actions. Can you remember a time that required you to dig down really deep to ultimately control a situation and be better rather than being angry or out of control? I suspect, given your occupation, that you have. I used to be a fairly normal guy who lived in a fairly normal world, but neither of those is really true anymore. So back to the 4 a.m. telephone call. It was Memorial Day weekend in 2007. I dragged my butt out of bed, went to, into my office, and I answered the phone. The caller identified himself as an emergency room doctor in Somerville, Massachusetts. He asked if I was the father of Paul Ferris. He said he was sorry to call this early in the morning. And then he said, your son Paul is dead. He said Paul was killed in a crash, but he didn't have any other details. I asked if anyone was with Paul, thinking about his girlfriend, Caitlin. The doctor said there were four other individuals, and they were transferred to other hospitals, but he didn't know who they were where they were transferred, nor the extent of their injuries. The doctor then said, well, I assume that the police have called you. And I said, no, they have not. And he said, well, they'll certainly call you soon. They did not. But let me save that story for another presentation. By the time I hung up, my wife, Roberta, was awake, and she was standing next to me. And I then had to tell her that our firstborn son was dead. We cried, we screamed, we even called the hospital back to see if it was real. But it was real, it was too real. Paul was killed because a person failed to stop for an officer and a high-speed, multi-city pursuit ensued. A man in his pregnant girlfriend's parents' SUV ran from an officer because he didn't want to be stopped for driving without a license for the eighth time. Fact is that the courts kept allowing this person who never had a license back on the street over and over again. The trooper chased through several cities, ending in a Boston suburb that has a violent felony only pursuit policy because it's the most densely populated city in all of New England. But the chase continued. Barely a minute after the officer had advised Somerville PD that he'd crossed into their jurisdiction, he was back on his radio calling for fire and medical to respond to the site of a horrific crash. The fleeing SUV screaming down Somerville's dark streets at 76 miles an hour with his headlights turned off struck the taxi in which Paul and Kate were riding. The taxi was actually lifted and thrown onto the adjacent sidewalk. Paul was ripped from his seatbelt and thrown onto the side of a house. When emergency responders finally got there and discovered Paul, they thought he was a pedestrian who had been struck by that flying taxi. Paul died at the scene. The autopsy received several years later was the most horrible thing I've ever read in my life. The taxi driver was kept on life support for one week, and then they disconnected him. He left behind a wife, 
and a four-year-old son. Kate had massive head trauma, broken ribs, and a shattered pelvis. She was barely alive, only because she'd been sitting in the middle of the back seat, and she was wearing her seatbelt. Doctors at the hospital gave very little reason for hope, given the severity of her injuries. Kate remained unconscious for four weeks. She remained in the hospital for four months, and her recovery took many, many years. Frankly, the fact that Kate lived, nothing short of a miracle. So Paul was killed because a guy decided to run from a misdemeanor traffic stop. A trooper who was working within his emergency vehicle operations policy believed that it was necessary to chase, even though they were in a densely populated residential area. What's important now? Was the chase that took Paul's life? I ask myself that every day. And the answer is always the same. No, it wasn't. That driver and his girlfriend were not endangering anybody until they began to run. The infraction was an illegal U-turn, and a quick license plate check would have actually shown the Somerville address where he was running. Some days the memories still knock the wind out of me. Roberta and I have to live without a son. And our youngest, Scott, will spend an even longer lifetime without his brother and his best friend. That really makes me bitter. Every day I try to be just a little bit better. You've probably heard this before, but the loss of a child is truly inexplicable. I can't begin to explain the confusion, the pain, the heartache, and, and most of all, the emptiness that's with you every single day. My life, which was focused before, became murky. Nothing feels the same anymore. Nothing is the same anymore. <laughs> Many people think and say, you know, well, you should be angry at the police. Usually, I'm not but I'm incredibly sad about the chase decision that was made that night. Shortly after Paul's death, I began to research police pursuits, and what I found was truly frightening. I had no idea how many there were. There are literally thousands upon thousands of them, and way too often, someone is hurt, an innocent bystander or a law enforcement officer. So I'm standing here today as an advocate trying to increase awareness about the dangers of especially the nonviolent felony type pursuits. We need to make changes. So how bad is it? It's very bad. It's been said that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. This fits well with pursuits. Through August of this year, five brave law enforcement professionals have died during police pursuits. And we have no idea how many have been injured. As for innocent bystanders, there isn't enough time to show you all of those killed in 2017. And just like LEOs, we have no idea how many have been injured. I'll show you their faces and names as I speak. Bitter or better? That was truly my only choice. So I now advocate with and for law enforcement to try to enhance and make changes that will save more lives. Detailed police pursuit statistics are incredibly difficult to come by. There are some limited highly inaccurate numbers because some states actually have mandatory reporting and do report that data to the feds. Wisconsin happens to be one of those five states. The other, the other four are California, Michigan, Minnesota, and Pennsylvania. So what do we know about the pursuits? We know there's tens of thousands of them. We know the vast majority, over 90%, started because of a misdemeanor, not a violent felony. We know that a huge percentage, 
end in a crash. And in those crashes, very often, one or more people are killed or injured. Even with weak federal tracking, we know that at least one person a day is killed in a police pursuit. And at least one third of those are innocent bystanders. And perhaps of even greater interest to this group, FBI studies indicate that on average, seven LEOs are killed in police chases or responding to a pursuit in progress. In 2015, USA Today did a huge research project and an expose on police pursuits that occurred between 1979 and 2013. And the stats were telling. We could spend hours talking about that. <laughs> one third of the ch chases that they, one third of the chases that they researched ended in a crash. They verified over 12,000 people who were killed in those. And then they did a subsequent study and that number of 12,000 was raised to closer to 15,000 people. And chases resulted in a death much more frequently than previous studies had shown. When it comes to pursuit-related injuries, there are no federal statistics. However, a study done by the FBI indicated that injuries occur about five times as often as deaths. So if you interpolate that 15,000 deaths onto that five times as many, you end up with about 75,000 people who would have been injured during that study period time that USA Today did. When you think about that, the economic and societal costs are in the billions of dollars. And in the single year of 2014, FBI indicated there were 52,000 chases in the United States. 52,000. So what about Wisconsin pursuits? In 2015, the last year that data is available, Wisconsin logged 1,340 pursuits, which was 432 more than the prior year. So for anyone who thinks that it doesn't happen in sleepy Wisconsin, yeah, it happens here too. And a Wisconsin investigative study found that uh, many injuries and deaths had never been reported. And had those been reported, the death stat in Wisconsin would have grown by 50%. When I speak with the Madison Police Department's new recruit classes as part of their below 100 training, I like to show videos of chases that truly defy logic. One such video was a daytime pursuit in Minnesota, you may have seen it on TV, where three police cars chased a drug suspect through residential backyards and then swung onto the local golf course, scattering golfers in all directions. What's important now? Research indicates the majority of drivers who flee did not cause an immediate threat to anybody prior to the chase. It's the chase itself that causes an immediate danger to innocent bystanders, and more importantly, to LEOs. So I continue to work with partners, LEOs, tech firms, regulators, and legislators to raise awareness of the dangers of pursuits and to seek out means other than chasing while still apprehending the bad guys. We know for sure that technology is getting better and is providing options that can be viable. But we also know that law enforcement doesn't have near enough money to do anything. So we're working with federal legislators to try to get funding released so you can try the new technology. And we also think that those who begin to use next generation technology will then be able to look at their pursuit policies and strengthen those. Finally, we're working at the federal level to institute consistent and mandatory tracking for pursuit deaths and injuries. On the Saturday Paul was killed, I flew to Boston. I thought I was bringing him home. But because 
His death was a felony, an autopsy was required. And because it was a holiday weekend, I had to wait until the coroner's office could get to him. So my brother and I contacted Paul's landlord and got into his apartment. I could tell you there is nothing so completely freakish standing in your son's home knowing that he will never be there again. I collapsed in the front bedroom and I cried for a really long time. And I haven't stopped crying since. Paul always seemed to do anything and everything he could to be a better person. Now perhaps as parents, we each think this about our own kids. But regardless, I know he would want me working with law enforcement to try to solve this incredibly challenging problem and to save other innocent lives. I'll wrap up with a story about how my brother and I ended the memorial services that we held for Paul in Boston and Minneapolis. The first night in Boston I received an email and I didn't recognize the sender. But as I struggled through her message, I have to say that it totally blew me away. <laughs> I'm going to read it to you now, uh, hopefully without a meltdown. Hello, Mr. Ferris. Please let me start by expressing my deepest sympathy for you and your family. I can't imagine what you must be going through. I only knew Paul for a short period of time. I interviewed him for the job that he recently started and was amazed with him in every way. I actually knew before the interview was over that I had to hire him and have him in my unit. And he started working for me two weeks ago. I've worked here for 23 years. I started when I was 21. I was nothing like him when I was his age. I've never interviewed anyone like him. But I don't have to tell you because he was your son. I have three sons of my home own, and I went home after working with Paul for a few days to tell them all about him, about how amazing this new guy was, how inspired I was by him, and how lucky they would be to grow up to be like him. He was perfect, smart, motivated, outgoing, handsome, talented, friendly, everything a 23-year-old could possibly be. Yes, I only knew him for a very short time, but he really touched me, and I'm deeply saddened by this. I have to tell you that her note still makes me very proud. So bitter or better, I'm not even sure why or how, but I think that Paul's death has made me a stronger, better, and less bitter man. So as you, in the future, think about departmental policies related to always dangerous police pursuits, I hope you'll think about Paul and make decisions that will help save the lives of LEOs and innocent bystanders. Remember, being better doesn't belong to fate. It belongs to you. Thank you.